This second part of the tutorial is focusing on the reasons for the decline in the number of deaths. As you can see, the overall number of deaths is remaining pretty constant at around 600,000 per year. But when we talk about the death rate, the death rate is falling. The death rate is the number of deaths per thousand of the population per year. Now in 1900, the death rate stood at around 19 per thousand of the population. Whereas by 2007, which is up here, um, it's almost half to 10. So what um, are the reasons for the decline in death rate? Well, firstly, we need to identify what do pa people actually die from. They're more likely to be dying from disease, infectious diseases, and trying to identify that there has been a shift in the impact of these diseases. So he identified between 1850 and 1970, um, there was a decline in the death rate um, was due to a fall in the number of deaths from these infectious diseases such as diphtheria, influenza, which is another name for flu, scarlet fever, measles, smallpox, diarrhoea, typhoid and tuberculosis, TB. And these were more common in young people. So there's been a decline in those type of infectious diseases. He then identified that in the 1950s, on the other hand, there was an increase in diseases of affluence such as heart disease and cancers, which are caused by you living, um, maybe eating richer food or being overweight or smoking. And they're more likely to impact the middle aged um, more than the young people. So there's been a decline in deaths from these infections. The population might be more resistant um, and some diseases are just less powerful. But there are other social factors which are having a much more greater impact on these infectious diseases. And these include the following. There's been an improved nutrition according to McEwen. And this has accounted for up to half the reduction in death rates. This is particularly important in reducing the number of deaths from tuberculosis. There's also been medical improvements. Um, from the 1950s, there's been an improvement in medical knowledge, techniques and organisations, which is reducing the death rates. And these include antibiotics, immunisation, blood transfusions, better and higher standards of midwifery and maternity services, as well as setting up that NHS, the National Health Service in 1949. There's also been public health measures also, and in the 20th century, the central government and the local government, they had the power to pass certain laws, which led to a range of improvements in people's lifestyles. And these included housing. You, you've got to live in a drier, better ventilated, less overcrowded accommodation. Drinking water was a lot cleaner. Laws to combat um the adulteration of food and drink or pasteurization of milk and better sewage. And there was also um, public acts such as the Clean Air Act. And there's also other social changes uh, which has reduced the death rate in the 20th century. These include the decline of more dangerous jobs such as mining, smaller families, so there's less um, transmission of diseases or of infections, greater public knowledge of the causes of illness, higher incomes, and that leads to a healthier lifestyle. So all these impact the life expectancy. The life expectancy is how long on average a person born in a given year can expect to live. So for example, males born in 1900 Expect to live on average till they were about 50, 57 if you were female. Compare that to if you were born in 2003, you can be expected to live till you're 76.9 years if you were male, 81.2 for females. But, and here's an evaluation point, this is where you might get AO2 marks, even though there has been an increase in life expectancy, that death rate has been reduced 
in the last 100 years. There is class, gender and regional differences. For example, women generally live longer than men. Um, if you live in the north or Scotland, you have a lower life expectancy than if you live in the south. If you're working class and you work in an unskilled or a routine job or a manual job, you are three times more likely to die before you're 65 than compared to men who are in a managerial or professional job. So here we start to evaluate what is the impact of this decline in death rate and this increase in life expectancy. Well, one of the outcomes is that there is an aging population So as you can see on the graph or on the figures, the number of people aged 65 or over is projected to overtake the number of under 16s for the first time in 2014. Okay. And these are called age pyramids. And these show how older age groups are growing as a proportion of the population, while younger groups are shrinking. And if you can look quite closely in 1901, those that live over 80 or over is a very, very small proportion of the population compared to the under 19s, which are down here. And you can see that it's gradually starting to shift and to the projection in 2041. And this is Hirsch. He notes that the traditional age pyramid is disappearing. It is being replaced by more or less equal size blocks. And he says it's a result of several factors. There's an increased life expectancy. People are living longer into old age. Declining infant mortality rate. So nowadays, hardly anyone dies really early in life. And there's a decline in fertility. So there's fewer young people being born in relation to the older people in the population. To further evaluate, you need to talk about what the effects are of this ageing population. You can look at it in a number of ways. So firstly, on the public services, older people consume a lot more uh, services such as health and social care than other age groups. And in addition to an increased expenditure on health care, this ageing population may also mean changes to policies and provisions of housing, uh, transport and other services. For example, bus passes. There's also been an impact on one person pensioner households. The one person pensioner household now accounts for about 14% of all households. And the majority of these are female. And this is because women tend to long, live longer than men. And also women tend to marry older, um, older men than they are. And like when we talked about in terms of the birth rate, there's also an impact on the dependency ratio. In the same way as children are dependent, OAPs, the elderly population, especially the number of retired, this also has an impact on the dependency ratio and this causes an increase and it causes a burden on the working population. And this all creates this idea of a social construction of ageing as a problem. And we looked at social construction in the same way as we look at childhood. The way that we think about old age and ageing, we see it as being negative and society has created that growing old is a problem. There's been concerns about things like a pensioner time bomb. How are society going to meet the cost of providing pensions for the elderly? How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to care for our ageing pop population? And in modern societies, ageism has become a problem as well, which is a stereotype because the elderly are portrayed as being vulnerable, incompetent, irrational and a burden on society. When we know, in fact, that there are 70 year olds who are quite capable of going to work, they're quite capable, they're leading active and healthy lifestyles. And according to Townsend, the reason for these negative attitudes 
to the elderly in our society is that old age has been socially constructed as a period of dependency because of 